Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Citizens Financial Group First Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. My name is Alan, and I'll be your operator today. Currently, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Following the presentation, we will conduct a brief question and answer session. As a reminder, this event is being recorded. Now I'll turn the call over to Ellen Taylor, Head of Investor Relations. Ellen, you may begin. Thank you so much. We seem to have lost the feed from the main room. Thank you so much, Allie. Good morning to all. Thanks for joining us at the end of a very long week. First this morning, our Chairman and CEO, Bruce Sanson, and CFO, John Woods, will provide an overview of our results and our outlook, and will reference our presentation, which you can find at investor.citizensbank.com. And then, of course, we'll be happy to take questions. Brendan Coughlin, Head of Consumer Banking, and John McCready, Head of Commercial Banking, are here also to provide additional color. And now for some quick housekeeping. Our comments today will include forward-looking statements, which are subject to risk and uncertainty. And you should review the factors that may cause our results to differ materially from the expectations on page two of the presentation in our 2019 Form 10-K. We also utilize non-GAAP financial measures, so it's important to review our GAAP results on page three of the presentation and to utilize the information about these measures and the reconciliation of the GAAP in the attendance. Finally, if you want to ask, ask a question, please press one zero. And with that, I'll hand it over to Bruce. Thanks, Helen. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining our call. We're in the midst of unprecedented times with the coronavirus representing an unseen enemy that's wrecking havoc with people's lives and with our economy. As a large regional bank, we have an important role to play in supporting our customers through these challenges and in providing essential services to ensure smooth functioning of the economy. I am pleased with our performance to date. Citizens is rising to the occasion. We are working with borrowers on loan modifications and on access to government programs to ensure they have the best possible chance to make it through the crisis. We have used our strong balance sheet to meet over $7 billion in commercial line draws. We have kept our branches open to serve individuals and small businesses. We have two-thirds of our staff working remotely, and we have taken precautions to protect those colleagues who must report to work and have provided them with additional compensation. And we have made $5 million in grants to small businesses and nonprofit partners to help our communities through these difficult times. In short, we are doing what a responsible corporate citizen should be doing. Our financial performance in Q1 was heading towards an excellent quarter prior to the disruption caused by COVID-19 in March. Nonetheless, we had a very good revenue and TP&R results based by record mortgage revenue, strong loan growth, and expanding NIM. If you plug in charge-offs as our credit costs in Q1, we would have had a 94-cent quarter. But of course, the new CECL accounting standard requires a recalibration of lifetime losses on the loan portfolio given the significantly changed macro environment. This led to a $600 million provision representing a $463 million or 85-cent reserve build over charge-offs. As such, our underlying EPS was $0.09 cents in the quarter. We had $0.06 cents of notable items tied to our top program and Franklin integration costs, so reported EPS was $0.03. Cents. Now, this is more front-loaded than many analysts have modeled. We've assumed a deep recession in Q2, followed by a V-shaped recovery in our forecast, which, if true, would take us back to more normal provision levels over the balance of 2020. If the recovery is more U-shaped, provisions will be higher. Safe to say, there's a great deal of uncertainty over the economic outlook. We feel good that we have a strong balance sheet position with set one at 9.4%, our LDR at 95%, and a strong LCR with enormous contingent liquidity. Our tangible book value per share held steady at $32. 
and we are confident will sustain a strong level of PPNR over the balance of the Our decision to suspend share repurchases for the balance of 2020 should maintain a strong set one ratio through varying economic scenarios, including a U-shaped recovery. We have provided significant granular information on our credit portfolios in our investor deck. We believe we have maintained a highly prudent credit risk discipline. And as a reminder, our DFAS credit losses have consistently been better than the peer average. We have continued to make progress on all the strategic initiatives that we had teed up for 2020. Our colleagues have done a fantastic job of dealing with the COVID-19 related crisis while also making sure we are hitting our key VAU deliverables. Current environment presents new risks and opportunities. We are looking for ways to incorporate these into our strategy with an eye towards coming out of the crisis stronger than our peers. We are not cutting back on investments designed to drive future customer acquisition and revenue growth. All in all, a challenging time. We are handling things well. I hope you and your families are healthy and safe. With that, let me offer a welcome to Brendan as our new head of consumer. And now I'll turn it over to John. Thanks, Bruce, and good morning, everyone. On page four, let's start with a brief overview of our headlines as we navigate this unprecedented environment. We enter this crisis from a position of balance and strength. For example, after the stress experienced in March, we ended the quarter with a set one ratio of 9.4%, even after increasing our allowance for credit losses to $2.2 billion and funding approximately $7 billion of line drops. Our ACL to loans ratio of 1.73% compares well to stress loss scenarios as well as to peers. And our tangible book value per share at quarter end was nearly $32 per share, which is stable versus fourth quarter. Our liquidity ratios were stable with an LDR of approximately 96%, and we remain in compliance with the LCR. Earnings at the PPNR level proved to be resilient as we generated record revenues in fee income while observing significant negative COVID-19 impacts in multiple fee categories. As a result, we remain committed to investing in our strategic initiatives, including the Top 6 Transformation Program and our portfolio of strategic revenue initiatives. Moving to page 5, I'll cover some of the ways we are supporting our customers. Many of our customers have been directly impacted by the pandemic, and we have been swiftly moving to assist them during this difficult time while still taking appropriate steps to mitigate risk. So far, we've delayed payments on loans for about 70,000 retail customers, and about 2,400 small businesses. A number of our commercial clients have taken a defensive position as they prepare to weather the storm. Through April 15th, we funded about $7 billion in commercial line draw. After an initial rush to draw down on loans in March, we've seen the pace of line draws slow considerably. Finally, we have been literally working day and night to facilitate the SEA payroll protection program for smaller companies with less than 500 employees. As of April 15th, we have received applications from over 35,000 companies that have approximately $4 billion in loans registered with the SBA. Let's move to page 6 and cover CECL. We increased our allowance for credit losses by approximately $900 million to $2.2 billion at March 31st from approximately $1.3 billion at year end. This was created in two steps. The first was the previously communicated day one impact of $451 million effective January 1st. The second was a reserve bill of $436 million recorded as part of the first quarter provision of $600 million, which also included $137 million of charge-offs. At quarter end, the ACL to loans ratio was 1.73%. Retail portfolios had an allowance to loans ratio of 2.31%, based by longer duration or unsecured loans, while commercial portfolios had an allowance to loans ratio of 1.2%. We have also summarized the key aspects of our macroeconomic scenario, which is a foundational element of this useful reserve estimate. At quarter end, we elected to use the March 27th Moody's baseline, which integrates COVID-19 effects as our base scenario. Given the uncertainty of the continued economic outlook, we also included an alternate 
movie pandemic scenario and an internally generated scenario. Further, we incorporated the loss and adjustment factor to fully account for the benefit of our expected customer assistance efforts and the impact of the various government support programs on our portfolio. In general, our economic scenario assumes a steep drop in GDP in 2Q, followed by a V-shaped recovery in the second half of the year. If this scenario plays out, provision requirements over the balance of 2020 moves back to being tied for loan growth. If the pandemic impacts are deeper, or it takes longer for the economy to recover, and we are looking at a U or an L-shaped recovery, or government programs are less effective, we could require meaningful additions to provisions. Now let me move to the highlights of our underlying results covered on slide seven and eight. Despite the backdrop of COVID-19 pandemic and CISO-related reserve bills, our results highlight our operational discipline and the benefit of our diversified business model. We have record revenues and fee income, an improved net interest margin, and strong liquidity and funding metrics. For the quarter, we reported EPS of nine cents, which was down 84 cents year over year, and down 90 cents in this quarter, driven by the 85 cent impact of COVID-19 reserve bill of 463 million. PPNR of 678 million was up 3% year over year, and down only slightly in this quarter, despite COVID-19 headwinds and the impact of seasonality. We saw strong balance sheet growth, including 2% average loan growth with spot growth of 7%, which benefited NII and helped offset the impacts of the more challenging rate environment. And record fees were driven by record results in mortgage banking and wealth. We also saw strong underlying performance in capital markets and FX and IRP before COVID-19 impacts. On page nine, net interest income increased 1% last quarter as the benefit of 1% interest earning asset growth and improved mix was partially offset by the impact of the more challenging rate environment and data. Net interest margin increased four basis points in this quarter as loan yields benefited from widening LIBOR OIF spreads, as well as mix. Our proactive pricing actions produced an 11 basis points decline in deposit costs, which helped mitigate yield curve headwinds as one month LIBOR dropped 38 basis points. Moving to fees on slide 10. Non interest income was up 16% year over year, with relatively stable levels on the linked quarter basis. Record results in mortgage banking and trust and investment services fees were partially offset by the impact of COVID-19 that included a total of $36 million of fair value markdowns on loan trading and customer derivative assets in the linked quarter, as well as the impact of the shutdown in other categories. On a sequential basis, mortgage banking fees achieved another record by doubling to $159 million, which reflected strong refi lock volumes and improved day on sale margins. While management posted another solid performance with trust and investment services fees up 2% sequentially, as strong managed money sales offset the impact of market, de market declines. <clears throat> Capital market fees of 43 million decreased 23 million from record fourth quarter levels, driven by $21 million of marks on loan trading assets. Foreign exchange and interest rate product revenues decreased 25 million from record fourth quarter levels including a $15 million reduction from a net CBA adjustment given the falling rates and lower activity caused by reduced variable term lending volume. Turning to page 11, non-interest expense increased $30 million, or 3% linked quarter, largely reflecting seasonality and higher revenue-based comp compensation. Salaries and employee benefits were up 9% given the FICA tax and 401k match seasonal impacts along with higher compensation tied to strong, strong mortgage abbreviations in the quarter. Year over year, our non-interest expense was up 5%, largely reflecting the impact of growth-oriented investments, annual merit, and revenue-based compensation, which were partially offset by efficiencies generated from our top programs. Let's now discuss loan trends on page 12. Average core loans were up 2% linked quarter, and up 3% before the impact of loan sales activity tied to our balance sheet optimization initiatives. During the quarter, we sold an additional $500 million in non-relationship mortgages, which coupled with fourth quarter activity reduced average loans by almost $1 billion. <clears throat> On a late quarter basis, 
Core commercial loans were up 3%, driven by the impact of higher line draws and strength in CRE. Core retail loans were up 1% in the quarter and up 2% before the impact of the loan sales activity, given growth in education and merchant financing partnerships. On a linked quarter basis, period end loan growth was 7%, driven by 15% increase in commercial, given higher line of credit utilization and relatively stable retail loans. Moving to page 13, we saw a nice average deposit growth of 1% linked quarter and 5% year over year as we benefited from investments we've made over the past several years to expand and enhance our capabilities. On a period end basis, deposits were up 7%, keeping pace with loan growth. We continue to manage down our deposit costs across all channels, reducing CD rates, retail money market promo rates, and taking down the savings rate in our digital bank, and managing commercial deposits aggressively. As a result, our interest-bearing deposit costs were down 15 basis points. Next, let's move to page 14 and cover credit. We continue to assess the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and instituted a variety of measures to identify and monitor areas of potential, potential risk. Non-performing loans increased 11% linked quarter, driven by a $69 million increase in commercial, largely tied to a few non-correlated loans and modestly higher retail. The NPL ratio of 61 basis points increased two basis points linked quarter and improved two basis points year over year. Net charge-offs came in at 46 basis points in the quarter, up modestly linked quarter, reflecting an increase in commercial, partially offset by a decrease in retail. The allowance for credit losses to non-accrual loans ratio ended the quarter at 283% compared with 179% in the first quarter of 2019, up from 184% in the fourth quarter of 2019. Turning to page 15, we have been highly disciplined on credit with prudent risk appetite. In consumer, we remain focused on super prime and prime borrowers. The weighted average FICO score across our portfolios is 760, and approximately 90% of the retail portfolio has a refreshed FICO of 680 or better. Overall, our commercial portfolio is highly granular and diversified in terms of geography, industry, and asset class. Roughly 60% of the portfolio is investment grade on a bond equivalent rating basis, and the risk ratings improved year over year. And we remain underweight peers in commercial real estate. We have been very disciplined around client selection and have focused on sponsors and developers that we've seen perform well and responsibly in prior cycles. And on slide 16, it's also important to note that our company run DFAS severely adverse scenario results performed in line or better than the peer average, which we believe indicates that we are relatively well positioned to manage through the current crisis. On page 17, we highlight the granular and diversified nature of our commercial portfolio, along with the areas in commercial that have been most, most immediately impacted by the COVID-19 shutdown and low energy prices. We have done a deep dive across the majority of the commercial portfolio to identify cash flow and liquidity vulnerabilities with an eye towards helping our customers through these challenging times while taking additional steps to more tightly manage risk. Together, these sectors account for approximately 11% of total CFG loans. Overall, we think that the percentage of our portfolio concentrations to these areas of perceived risk are largely at or below peer median. We've highlighted on the slide some of the factors that we consider to be risk mitigants to these portfolios and we have individual tear sheets in the appendix on each industry that provides more detail on the factors we are monitoring. Moving to slide 18 on retail credit. Our refresh FICO scores on the consumer side of the house are around 760, and 70% of the portfolio is collateralized. So for some of the areas of potential concern, I would just highlight briefly, in education, we've got, again, very high FICOs, and in the in-school book, is 95% cosigns. In the education refinance portfolio, borrowers have been in the workforce for six years on average, and 55% of them have advanced degrees, and about a third of the portfolio has been co-signed. The Consumer Unsecured Book includes $2.5 billion of short-duration merchant partnership loans, largely driven by the Apple platform, as well as loans through Vivint, ADT, and Microsoft, and a firm for Peloton. 
It's important to note that the vast majority of this portfolio is subject to loss sharing arrangements. And the remaining $1.5 billion is our unsecured installment portfolio, which, which has a very high focus scores of 760 on average. As with commercial, we've included more details on these consumer portfolios in the appendix. On page 19, as previously mentioned, we feel well positioned to manage through the current environment with strong capital and liquidity positions. Strong deposit growth kept pace with elevated loan growth, leaving our liquidity metrics steady. We have a diversified funding profile with a very strong base of core deposits and substantial capacity to do more for our clients as they manage through the crisis. In March, we announced that we would cease share repurchases, and with the extent of the pandem pandemic disruption becoming clearer, we have decided to extend that through the end of the year to ensure that capital levels are strong to meet loan demand. We expect to remain well capitalized and intend to maintain the dividend at the current level. On page 20, I want to take into a few exciting things that are happening across the company. While we are first and foremost focusing on helping our clients, we have not stopped working to help build a better company. We are driving forward on our strategic initiatives so that we emerge well positioned for the future. We are continuing to execute on the transformational top program, and we are also moving forward with our major strategic revenue initiatives while considering new opportunities arising from the current environment in an effort to drive higher revenue growth coming out of the crisis. Moving to page 21, given the impact of the pandemic, it's challenging to predict an outlook for the future and we no longer affirm our full year 2020 guidance. Nonetheless, we do, however, want to offer some higher level commentary on key categories for full year 2020, with a reminder that we currently expect to see more of a V-shaped recovery start to play out in the back half of the year. We believe we can deliver modest growth in net interest income, which includes the benefit of the PPP program. We expect that strong loan growth will more than offset a meaningful decrease in net due to rates. And non-interest income is now expected to be broadly stable as strength of mortgage is offset by COVID-19-driven weaknesses in other categories. The outlook for fees will depend upon the pace and magnitude of recovery through the second half of 2020. Non-interest expense is expected to be up modestly given higher compensation tied to stronger mortgage production and impacts from COVID-19, which includes government lending programs and customer relief efforts. Provision expense has the greatest potential for variability in 2020 and will depend on the depth of the recession and the pace of recovery. We expect to see strong loan growth driven by higher line draws in commercial, the impact of government programs like PPP, as well as with increased demand in education and merchant financing. At the same time, we anticipate a strong increase in commercial and retail deposits reflecting heightened liquidity given Fed actions and the low-rate environment. Our regulatory capital ratios are expected to strengthen from current levels under the B recovery scenario as net income, coupled with the suspension of buybacks through year-end, more than offset the impact of higher RWAs. Even in more, in more severe economic scenarios, we expect our capital ratios to meet, remain strong and above required minimums. Now let's move to page 22 for some high-level commentary on the second quarter. We expect NII to be up low to mid-single digits as strong loan growth more than offset the sizable decrease in them. The income is expected to be down in the low to mid-single digit range, reflecting COVID-19 impacts on service charges, card, and other fees. Non-interest expense is expected to be up slightly given the COVID-19 impacts mentioned earlier. But net-net, we would expect positive operating leverage in the quarter. For business expense, will depend on the depth of recession and pace of recovery. Finally, we expect significant loan growth reflecting line draws in commercial, the impact of government programs, and increased demand in education. Our capital, liquidity, and funding positions are expected to remain strong. To sum up, on page 23, we are focused on delivering well for our stakeholders in these challenging times. We have a strong balance sheet and leadership team and colleague base that give us confidence that we'll rise to the occasion. Now let me turn it back to Bruce. Okay, thank you, John. And operator, uh, let's open it up to Q&A, please. 
Thank you, Mr. Vanson. And now we are ready for the Q&A portion of the conference call. If you'd like to ask a question, please press 1, then 0 on your touchtone phone. You'll hear an indication that you've been placed in queue, and you may remove yourself from the queue at any time by repeating the 1, then 0 command. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any buttons and also make sure that your phone is unmuted as well. Again, for questions at this time, press 1, then 0. Our first question will come from the line of Erica Nigerian. Go ahead, please. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for all the detail that you provided. I'm wondering, as we think about a potential U or W-shaped recovery, um, how does the economic parameters that are playing out um, during this pandemic compare to the DFAS scenarios that imply a cumulative loss rate of 4.1% over nine quarters? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start off on that, Erica. Um, I mean, I think the way, that, the way that we look at this, just big picture, and, um, is how, you know, when you look at our reserve to loans ratio of 2.2, the 2.2 billion that we have and that 1.73%, that really positions us well when you go back and look at the 2018 cycle, which is the last time we went through the Fed process, and it also positions us well for the 2020 cycle for based upon our internal estimates of how much coverage we're creating. So just to cover a few numbers on that front, uh, if you go back to the, the Fed scenarios and look at the adverse scenario, and there's been a fair amount of analysis that, that illustrates that the rate environment and other aspects of the adverse are pretty similar to what we're going through today. And our $2.2 billion would represent 86 billion, I'm sorry, 86 percent of, of coverage um, on those losses in the adverse scenario in terms of our internal estimates. Um, the Fed numbers uh, would be around 55 percent. If you, uh, you know, we think we'll do better than the Fed. We've had remapping issues that have um, gone in our favor, and we've consistently estimated losses that would be lower than the Fed, uh, Fed models would indicate. But even if you were to look at the Fed models, we have 55% coverage of the, of the adverse scenario from back then. Um, uh, you know, you fast forward to even if there was a severely adverse scenario, uh, you know, similar to what uh, the Fed scenario would uh, indicate in 2020, our coverage would be around 45%, which we believe is um, maybe better than uh, better than uh, maybe some uh, some uh, some peers, uh, given the, the comments made earlier about where we think our loss ratios are going to come out. So we think that positions us very well, um, and maybe I'll stop there and see if that's um, that's responsive. Got it. Uh, and my my follow up question is, I'm wondering if you could help quantify the magnitude of net interest margin decline in the second quarter, and of that magnitude. Sure. How much would be attributed to the payment protection program? And if we assume that those loans pay off by third quarter, does that mean that NIM could be at a higher starting point um, in third quarter versus 2Q? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so the way I would look through it is you start off with uh, the rate environment itself. And given, given the LIBOR OAS spread widening out in the first quarter, we really haven't felt all of the impact of, uh, of the, the, the rate cuts from 1Q, and there's an expectation that that'll narrow in in the, in the second quarter. And so LIBOR and rates in general, we have, we have expectations will be down, call it 70 basis points or so across the curve, both in the short end and the long end. Um, in the past, we've indicated that for every 25 basis points, you would, you would, you would see about $15 million uh, of NII impact uh, with respect to NIM. Uh, and so that'll help you um, help you uh, triangulate, uh, you know. And for for that that 15 million is typically in the neighborhood of three and a half basis points. So so if you triangulate all of that, that'll better give you a sense for maybe low teens impact due to rates. Um, you know, the other aspects we have to look at in 2Q is mix, as you mentioned. You know, how large will the will the PPP program be? That is an dilutive. Uh, what is our mix in the rest of the loan portfolio? We're seeing a reasonably good loan demand underlying the, the PPP and other, other line draws. So that's still happening in our education portfolios and merchant finance that we indicated earlier. That actually provides a benefit. 
So, but when you look at all of those things, we still think that there'll be, a, um, you know, that there will be a, a meaningful and significant decline in net interest margin given rates in the second quarter. Um, uh, the the third, you know, your, your question about third quarter, based on how we're planning to account for PPP, which at the moment looks like we'll all flow through the NII line. And, uh, and if you think about the forgiveness cycle, if we're, if we're going to amortize the, the fees that we expect to earn on the PPP program over the contractual life of the loans uh, up through the forgiveness date. So if you expect maybe eight to ten weeks after funding that there could be some forgiveness, a majority of loans being forgiven, given that this is intended to be a grant program, you would see all that come into NII in the third quarter, all on, all driving net interest margin, then that would reset net interest margin higher in the third quarter. And I would just add, Eric, uh, also that you commented on NIM, uh, but don't lose sight of the fact that we're calling NII to be up uh, in Q2 because the volume, the volume effects should offset the, the NIM contraction. Got it. Thank you for taking my questions. Your next question will come from the line of Ken Zerby. One moment, please. Your line is Great. open. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Um, I really appreciate the guidance that you gave on slide six about Cecil. I, I think it helps out tremendously. Um, the question I have, just your first bullet there, you talk about you're using Moody's baseline, but you're also saying you're using your own internal assumptions. Can you just talk a little bit more about your own internal assumptions? Are they more severe or less severe than Moody's? And, and how much weight did you put on your own assumptions versus the Moody's assumptions? Thanks. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. So, um, you know, I think our baseline scenario that has this overweight is the Moody's 327. Um, the internal scenario, I would say, is maybe equal to slightly uh, more tentative um, than, than that scenario. We have another Moody's scenario. At, at the time that we were closing our books, so I think the 327 was baseline was really one of the most punitive Moody scenarios that it were out, was out there. So we had another that was a was slightly um, less punitive than that, coming um, but still pandemic driven. So uh, we used three in general, uh, but the majority was really um, uh, um, was really focused on this Moody's baseline. Um, the other scenarios had a variety of other um, lenses lenses associated with it. I mean, we have this 18% down. Uh, with, uh, with GDP and the 9% on unemployment. But as an example, our internal scenario would have gotten un unemployment up to 11%. Uh, so just to give you a sense for how we, we mix and match here, there's a significant amount of uncertainty, which is why we use multiple scenarios, and we, help, we, we think that helps inform the ultimate, um, ultimate outcome. Okay. I, I, would add, I would add, Ken, too, that you know, we were – you know, trying to be as conservative as we could, I think, uh, by taking that uh, very late uh, forecast into account. We've uh, certainly been watching uh, where has the Moody's uh, scenario uh, model moved, uh, and I'd say it's moved a little more uh, conservatively. Uh, it's hard to say, um, you know, what exactly, what, how that translates into uh, impact on our reserving at this point. I think we just have to see more data uh, play out before we can look at that. So if the recession is either deeper, uh, which currently looks like uh, that could be the case, uh, and then the uh, recovery ends out extending a little bit, which I'm not sure uh, necessarily is the case. We just have to see. I mean, there's certainly a big groundswell for starting to reopen the economy given the pain that everybody's suffering. So we'll just have to watch those two factors uh, and then go back and update things uh, as we get uh, to the end of the second quarter. Okay, great. And then just one other question. On the same slide, you mentioned that if there is a U-shape uh, recovery, for example, you could have meaningfully higher provisions. Like, I, I understand the concept, but I guess my question really is, like, it seems that your the assumptions you've made went from, let's say, a good period, right, to, you know, before the pandemic, to something really bad, including the, the deep recession, can you just help us understand if there is a U-shaped recovery and it takes another quarter for things to get better, why does provision why, – why, why, why would provision be meaningfully higher the next step? I mean, maybe not higher than first quarter, but why would it be as, you know, fairly large given the vast majority of your assumptions 
that you've already made sort of the vast majority of the negative revisions, so to speak, if that makes sense to your economic models. Yeah, um, maybe I'll answer it this way, Ken. I mean, I think one thing to we, – we, as, as Bruce mentioned, we, we did look and, and notice that since uh, March 27th, uh, Moody's has updated, I think it was on April – it was earlier this week, April 13th, earlier this week. And, you know, every, we've, we're seeing some eye-popping GDP numbers that come out, you know, instead of 18, it's 30, et cetera. I think the, the, the depth is one thing, but the, the length of the, the – the, the downturn in terms of whether it's you as another, you know, at a, at a very at a very big picture, I think one way to to think about this is if something like that were to occur, I, I would I would I would basically um, uh, I think we're positioned in a way that our capital ratios, which are around 9.4 percent at the end of the quarter, would remain broadly stable to up slightly, even if we were to directionally consume another scenario that would have, uh, you know, uh, certain as the, the aspects of Moody's update that would have taken GDP down to 30 percent. And I think that that's what this is about, is articulating capital strength. And, you know, our allowance to loan coverage would, would, of course, increase. It would get to something with a two-handle on it as opposed to 173. And uh, But nevertheless, our capital ratios would would be broadly stable to up, potentially even up slightly under one of those scenarios. And yeah, I would just, uh, to, to your specific question as to why, can uh, you know, I'd say if it takes longer to, to, to get back uh, to, to an operating economy, clearly there's more stress on companies uh, that, uh, that can't open and start collecting revenues and serving customers. Uh, and then clearly uh, individuals don't get back to work as quickly. Uh, so there's more stress on individuals. So, you would just have to do the recalibration on that and uh, and see where that where that uh, puts you. So I think it's it's possible. I think we we, we put a good number on the board here um, in the first quarter, um, and uh, we'll have to wait and see if, uh, how much adjustment we'd have to make uh, based on further input. But uh, in any case, I think John did uh, underscore the big point, which is our capital ratio is strong and can absorb that, and uh, so we feel good that we can both. Uh, meet the loan demand coming in from our customers, uh, put away what we need to if we need more reserves, and still maintain a very strong capital position. All right. Thank you very much. Your next question will come from the line of Terry McAvoy with Stevens. Go ahead. All right. Thanks. Good morning. Um, maybe starting with fee income, I was hoping you could expand a bit on your, your second quarter outlook. I know you mentioned service charges and cards, but any insight and thoughts into, say, mortgage uh, and, and capital markets? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start off. I mean, I think that what we've, we've seen uh, another record quarter in mortgage um, and uh, record, record in wealth. Uh, you know, on the capital markets front, um, all, you know, frankly, before the loan trading mark that we took, uh, which had an impact of $21 million in the quarter, we were having, having an exceptional quarter on top of so, uh, exceptional, exceptional quarter in four, in, in four Q. So, um, mortgage outlook is still quite strong. We had a, we had a, an excellent quarter in one Q. I think um, our early expectations are that, that we'll have um, a similar uh, performance in two Q. I mean, it's, it's early days and things can move quickly, but um, but from what we've seen in April. Uh, you know, although maybe lot volumes may not be quite as strong as they were in the first quarter, for first quarter uh, margins have, have really, um, uh, frankly, increased to levels that we've never seen before, uh, given all of the operational capacity issues across, um, you know, the the, um, the industry. And we've been a source of um, of uh, uh, financial strength and execution certainty. And that has driven our margins up in Morgan. And, and allowed us to gain market share as well. Absolutely. And we're, and we're taking share across all our channels, which is really excellent to see. It's positioned us extremely well. Um, and, and, um, and in the wealth space, we've been able to, to have, uh, frankly, managed money sales, a really um, nice uptake there that's been offsetting our market, our market declines. And, uh, you know, so we've had good, good momentum on that front. Um, and, uh, and then in, in capital markets, it's uh, it's uh, really market dependent. So um, those are those are some. Why don't we Why don't we let Brendan uh, offer any further perspective on consumer, and then Don, you could offer a comment on the 
uh, commercial. Yeah, well, well said. I think, uh, John, on mortgage, uh, the non-banks are uh, uh, having some challenges as well, so we're swooping in to take some share and uh, supporting your comments around margins widening out. We expect that to broadly continue. Our pipeline is extremely full. Uh, we're growing our LOs uh, uh, mildly through Q1 and into Q2, so we expect mortgage to continue to be extremely strong through the quarter. Uh, on the service charge line, uh, our debit transactional volume was down at the end of March, 35 to 40 percent, less driving the, uh, the, the pullback in Q2, both on debit fees, but also less transactions leads to less overdraft occurrences. So we do expect that to recover towards the back half of Q2, uh, broadly aligned with our guidance and the uh, uh, B-shaped recovery in through Q3 and Q4, but that's putting some strain on um, on, on Q2 for service charges, and I think John covered the wealth uh, story really well, so I won't add anything to that. And on capital markets, um, I think that in general, deal activity will be low because of the uncertainty in the environment, but there are a couple of encouraging signs we're beginning to see. I mean, there's huge inflows into the high-yield funds over the last couple of days. We're actually seeing more high-yield issuance as companies try to garner more liquidity and, and buffer their, uh, their liquidity positions, so we're benefiting a little bit from that now. And um, you'll remember that we also bought another uh, boutique M&A firm uh, this quarter, and they happen to be very focused on restaurant restructuring businesses. So we're beginning to see some opportunistic flow there. And I'll just, I'll also mention that um, we're actually seeing some quite strong activity in our IRP businesses right now, as, as companies actually are, are garnering liquidity by restructuring existing swaps and, and putting some uh, swaps on the books. Um, uh, to take advantage of the current position. And, and on the mark that John talked about, we've actually seen about 30% of that reverse already as we've seen rallies in both the leverage loan market and the high yield market. So some of that's come back uh, to us already. So we're, we're cautious, but we're seeing a few signs of life out there. Good. Thank you. We'll go next to the line of Matt O'Connor with Deutsche Bank. Go ahead. Good morning. So there's been some ongoing concerns in the market that you take more credit risk, and you know I think some of the details that you provide today should alleviate those concerns. Um, you know, but here we are entering a credit cycle, and I think this is a chance to show that your credit uh, is not worse than others. Um, obviously, your estimates internally uh, are better than peers, but as we think out over the next several quarters, couple years. You know, what, what are the metrics that we should be looking at to evaluate your credit performance versus others? And it's, it sounds like an obvious question, but, but obviously there's all these payment deferrals going on, um, so it may not be as straightforward as kind of look at the traditional trends, um, but wondering how you would uh, think about and, and frame that. Yeah, uh, let me start, and then, John, you could, you could pick up. But, you know, it's almost uh, – I remember – uh, when when we did have that perception out there that we had grown fast and it won't end well, and so we, I had people inside the shop say, uh, gee, just wait till we get a recession and then we can prove it. I uh, really almost wish for a recession. I said, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> because I'd be happy to just have gone many, many quarters and years without uh, experiencing a recession. But here we are. So, um, you know, I think we feel really, really good first off on the consumer side of the house that uh, each of those portfolios that we have, we've stayed uh, with a very conservative risk appetite, super prime, high prime. Uh, we've moved into spaces where we think we can get good risk adjusted returns even with that conservative risk profile. And so uh, you saw us grow, uh, explore and pioneer the, the growth of the education refinance market, which we think is one such place, uh, and then also in our merchant financing uh, unsecured business where we have lots of sharing arrangements with very strong credit counterparties that uh, also, I think, gives us uh, a very good risk-adjusted rate of return in those portfolios. And so some of the, uh, the, the Fed modeling doesn't pick that up, and we obviously have the ability to understand that and pick that up. So I do think we'll end up uh, performing well on the consumer side, better than expectations, and I think better than peers. And so that would be kind of the bedrock that you, sh you should be watching that, and I think hopefully uh, you'll, you'll see us deliver on that. Uh, and then as similarly on commercial, uh, we have, as we've grown the book, we've, we've actually – uh, grown faster uh, with bigger uh, companies, bigger bigger customers, 
uh, in the mid corporate space, and those customers tend to be more highly rated than, than the middle market companies. Um, and so uh, there again, uh, that should benefit us uh, when we when we go through this period. Uh, and I think we've also been uh, very disciplined in terms of uh, the industries that we're banking, trying uh, to be stay well diversified, uh, trying to make sure our hold positions are granular. Uh, and so I think that should also provide a benefit uh, in the areas of commercial real estate uh, or uh, 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 sponsors. We've also kept the list of counterparties that we want to deal with tight, quite tight. Uh, folks that we we know with we we know and have done business with for a long time. We think they're good operators. We think they treat treat their banks well. Uh, so I think that should also uh, work in our favor. Uh, and then I guess you'd look at the same things. You'd be looking at uh, you know the charge off rate in those portfolios uh, over time. So uh, anyway, I think we will. Uh, that's the proving time, so we feel good about uh, how we've maintained our discipline and how we've done BSO and repositioned ourselves to make higher net interest margin and better returns while uh, keeping an incredible discipline on the risk part of the equation. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, uh, Bruce, I mean, I think you asked about metrics. I mean, I'm, I guess I'd break it down. Um, you know, charge-offs um, has, have always been lagging. They may be even more lagging in this cycle than, than in the past, given all the forbearance activities that we're going to be engaging in. But nevertheless, we will be monitoring, monitoring them. You know, as you think about the current positioning, you know, we're, I think a, we, we keep an eye on reserves to total loans, which we indicated was 1.733% today. Um, I would also um, maybe just, just highlight the diversification across the balance sheet and keep an eye on that. You know, we're, uh, we are right around 50-50 in terms of commercial retail, and when you dig into each one of those books, whether it's on the commercial side, you, you know, areas of interest or concern are all in the low, very low percentages of the overall book um, and, um, and geographically diversified as well. And then, you know, on the, on the, re, you know, on the retail consumer side of things, you know, you mostly collateralized. Uh, in areas that we, we understand and have been in businesses for a very long time. And where we are not collateralized, it's distributed across several different asset classes, not all car. I mean, we're in student, we're in card, we have merchant finance, and there's a personal and secure product. So, so we think that is the name of the game there. So those are the current metrics. Forward-looking metrics um, really comes down to stress results, which we've fared better than median in the past, and our internal modeling which we have, uh, have, have been increasing levels of sophistication over time, and, uh, and we've been back-testing and trying to keep current. So I think those are the three areas you want to monitor when you're thinking about things through the cycle. And can you just that, – that's all helpful, Color. Can you just remind us um, this uh, slide 16 where you talk about your internal um, stress tests showing loss rates going down 50 bips for us last year. Do you mind us what drove that? Was that some de-risking or model changes, or um, just remind us what drove that big drop? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there was a, a couple things. I mean, I think the, that over time we've been uh, doing a better job of mapping our risk ratings uh, to we, we were uh, basically had um, had under you know frankly underappreciated the strength of the risk ratings across the portfolio. And so that was a driver of the improvement. Secondly, um, the full effect of loss sharing arrangements um, in our merchant finance portfolios were being uh, fully built in. Um, and then third, just over time, the, port, the, uh, the non-core portfolio has been, follow, has been, has been dropping, which had, had some higher loss content. It's gotten down to a very small level. So those are the things that come to mind for me in terms of what the drivers were. Yeah. And, and I think also the – the cumulative benefit of BSO is uh, also uh, being picked up as well. Thank you. Our next question will be from Brian Ferran with Autonomous. Go ahead, please. Brian? Mr. Ferran, you're live. You. Uh, Mr. Fran, we've lost your line. If you would hit one, then zero again, we can try to open it once more. Take the next question. Take the next Mr. Fran, your line is open. Yeah, um, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, going back to the stress test, um, I wonder if you could just speak a little more to the impact of Fed support and, you know, broader government stimulus. And, and I'm sure it's hard to put a number on it, but, you know, I guess the thing that's striking to me is if I look at unemployment and GDP, you know, clearly we're probably going to be worse, at least for a little while. You know, but on the other side, you know, it assumes the stock market's at 13,000, triple B credits, uh, credit yields are at 6.5%, whereas, you know, they're at like 35 4% today. You know, so when you think about the balance between the macro versus asset prices, you know, clearly the macro is probably the, the biggest input, but how much of a buffer or shock absorber do those um, better asset prices give in your mind? Yeah, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I fully appreciate it. So you're asking. Well, I think that the, the, the uh, thrust of the question is, uh, you know, the Fed has obviously stepped up here, if I understand it, and uh, and that's made a big difference in the markets. Uh, certainly, the pricing of assets has come in, which is a signal that uh, uh, credit quality is uh, is better, uh, or potentially uh, companies will experience less stress, at least from solvency, as long as the the Fed is playing the way they're playing, and uh, so how how much uh, you know uh, weight do we place on that when we when we kind of do our modeling and look at the reserving that we're doing? Is that is that the question really? Is that the thrust of the question? That was yes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, you know, I'd say there, there's a couple of things. When when you, you it, it has a meaningful impact. I mean, I think that's one of the big uh, uh, items that distinguish this current stress environment from possibly the modeled environments you would see uh, coming out of the Fed, uh, ironically. <laughs> so so the, the, when you go back to the 2018 cycle and you see the, the results there, they don't have this massive stimulus that we, we have given reasonable weight to uh, in, our, in our outlooks. Um, and so that, that is embedded, um, and it's not just – the, the, the government actions, uh, which, which are significant on the fiscal front and the monetary front, it's also our internal actions that are idiosyncratic and all of the things that we're doing to get ahead of this uh, that are, are very hard to model. Uh, and, and like forbearance. Exactly. Forbearance. All the forbearance that we're doing, all the modifications that we're doing and how aggressive we're being there um, and, and our insights and, and instincts around where to uh, target those efforts, um, you know, we've built that in. Uh, in our modeling, yeah. along with the overall overall uh, support from the government, that that's a meaningful impact. And the other thing to keep in mind, and I, I should add this, the other the other important distinction when you look back at severely adverse scenarios, is that all of those scenarios are all U-shaped. You heard from Bruce earlier. U-shapes are very stressful. Um, these shapes are less so. And so even if GDP and prior severely adverse scenarios don't fall by as much as we're all saying it, that it could fall today. The fact that it stays low for such a long period of time is what creates all that stress in the prior severely adverse scenarios. So when you fast forward to where we are today, what we're assuming, um, you know, what we have in our numbers is more of a stronger recovery in 2H, so it's more V-shaped, and we also have uh, the support, uh, the, the significant support of the stimulus um, and our internal actions. Yeah, I do. I do think, though, it's it's safe to say uh, we've never seen. I mean, that the Fed has pulled out all their tools from their toolkit from the last go round, and then they've added more. Uh, and the, the the fiscal stimulus bill was uh, ginormous uh, and uh, and 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 very extensive and fast in terms of trying to get the cash out to help uh, companies and to help uh, individuals, and so. Uh, you know, we really don't have much to go by in terms of modeling all of that, uh, the, the, the kind of easing off of PDR treatment on forbearance to encourage that. That's another delta that hasn't been in prior models. So there's just a lot of uncertainty uh, overall with, uh, with this modeling. And I think, you know, all banks are doing the best they can, both with the scenario and then kind of some of the offsets. Uh, from federal uh, government actions, from uh, the, the Fed and Federal Reserve actions, and then from the internal actions, uh, which is why I think, uh, you know, we'll just need more time to clarify kind of what, what is that true picture as we, as we go through the second quarter. 
If I could sneak in one more, if I just think about your ability to maintain dollars of CEG1 capital uh, over the next year, like, you know, total loss absorption capacity, you know, I guess you've got $650 million a quarter, maybe $700 million of PP&R. Um, I mean, it seems like you would have some securities gains you could harvest if you needed to, which would pull it into CEG1 capital. And then you've got... Um, you know, some relief on the, the CECL accounting. Um, I, I mean, it kind of seems like when you add it all up, the, the loss absorption, so to speak, over the next four quarters, maybe it's like three and a half billion or something. Is that is that kind of a fair way to think about it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start. I, I, I would probably just say it's it's ample, um, you know, that we, we are very focused on uh, continuing to deliver strong levels of PPNR, I think that's one of the first lines of defense. And we see, uh, I think, notwithstanding uh, all of the, the change in the environment, uh, our PPNR level uh, was you know, still up versus a year ago in the first quarter, and it was uh, close to flat on a sequential quarter basis. And we think there's a good ability to sustain that uh, over the balance of the year. So you, you basically start with that. Uh, we have, uh, you know, obviously some BSO actions that uh, we, we could take uh, if we needed to, to uh, kind of release some RWAs and uh, also uh, create some additional capacity. And then I think on the capital line, uh, we think our dividend is secure, but we've curtailed buybacks for the rest of the year. So if you put that all together, um, I'd say our, we're very confident in our outlook that if the situation worsens, we have... Uh, very strong capital position and levers to pull and an ability to, uh, you know, continue to post uh, good set one ratios. Yeah, I mean, just, uh, just to add to that, I mean, I think it was mentioned stability in PP&R. That's, that's one of the first lines of defense and our diversified, increasingly diversified business model across NII and across fees is really uh, helping on that front. Our transformation programs are, are helping on that front. Um, I would also mention that, um, you know, I, you mentioned securities, uh, you know, just based upon where rates are, we, we exclude, uh, given we've excluded uh, AOCI from our capital ratios. But, but if you were to, um, if you were to, uh, you know, take a look at that, that's in the, it's almost a billion dollars of, um, of uh, marks that, that are unrealized. And so that's part of the, the balance sheet strength that you would want to look at. Um, you know, in the event that um, that you're trying to figure out that part of the, the story as well. I mean, all in, you know, uh, RWA is expected to rise during the year, and if our scenarios hold, we expect that our our, our set one ratios are going to be uh, stable to rising throughout the year. So you put all that together, and I think that's hopefully responsive to your your to triangulate what you're trying to get to in terms of where dollars of uh, capital strength will be. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. <clears throat> We will next go to the line of Gerard Cassidy with RBC. Go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning, John. Good morning, Gerard. I know, uh, first, the, the transparency of your slide deck is one of the best, so thank you for doing that. Um, it's very helpful for all of us. And on slide five, where you give us some good detail on the forbearance, and I know this is going to be a difficult question to answer, but two parts. What percentage of your portfolio do you think will actually ask for forbearance, both in the commercial and the retail? And then second, how are you guys going to monitor loans that are that go into forbearance and actually are going to be charged offs or they're going to be non accruals? But initially, they're going into forbearance because everybody's being permitted to do that. Can you share with us some of the guardrails that you might have to develop to make sure that you're not, and even, again, not doing it on purpose, but there's an extend and pretend, you know, limitation here? So, Gerard, it's, it's Don. On, on the commercial side, we've actually done an extremely detailed liquidity cash burn analysis across across the portfolio and bucketed our, uh, our clients into three buckets. One, a bucket that, that would need for some kind of restructuring and call it, we don't really call it forbearance in the, uh, 
in the uh, in the commercial bank to some kind of payment relief or, or restructuring of payments, and that's a very small portion of the portfolio, like less than five percent. Then there's another, maybe call it 20, 25 percent, where we think uh, two or three quarters out they're going to need some covenant restructuring and maybe some relief from covenants, depending how the recovery. Um, uh, uh, materializes, and then the vast majority of the portfolio we think looks just fine from a cash-on-cash cash standpoint. So we're really looking at everything cash-on-cash cash at this point, and uh, it'll be developing, but we're very comfortable that it's a relatively limited number of, of people in our portfolio that are going to need really payment relief. And Brenda, yeah, on the consumer side, uh, we've got about 4% of our portfolios in a forbearance uh, status at the moment. Uh, the majority of those are um, three-month forbearance programs. What's interesting is we're seeing um, a meaningful amount of our forbearance customers that are actually cash flowing and still making their payments. And so we believe a large uh, percentage of the, our customer base is doing this as a safety net uh, and not yet under uh, duress yet. So we're working hard on analytics to sub subsegment our forbearance portfolio to uh, uh, identify further treatments as they come off the 90 days. If there are some that have uh, significant stress and can't make their payment, we've got another lever for another 90 days uh, prior to having them roll through charge off. Uh, and for those that uh, waited through the, the quarter successfully, they'll come back into full uh, principal and interest payments. So we've got a variety of collections tactics and support tactics for our customers to help them make the right choices, a variety of other levers in our collection shop. Uh, uh, should uh, alternative programs make more sense than a, a full forbearance as well. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how the next uh, uh, few months goes. Okay. Thank you, Gerard. Next question. That will come from the line of Ken Usden with Jeffries. Go ahead, please. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask a little bit about that um, on the line draws. You guys mentioned in the, one of the earlier slides, obviously, how they had slowed through April and that, um, that the usage has been in the industries most affected. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, you mentioned that about 60% of the draws are, are converted to deposits. And what do we take away from that? Meaning, is it that the other 40% might be being used, or is it that those just aren't current customers? And you know, do you expect, um, how do you expect, you know, any sense that whether, you know, if the line draws are less at this point, um, that you're going to start to you know, see some of these just get paid down if, 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 in fact, you know, we do get the V-shape and how quickly? Thanks. Yeah, I would actually say we are seeing some pay downs already. I think, I think early days, say the first two weeks of the, uh, of the pandemic, we saw a lot of preemptive draws in size, particularly in the kind of triple B segment, which is where they were concentrated. So, the bigger companies felt very liquid with strong balance sheets. The, the, the weaker companies, frankly, don't have a lot of capacity for draw, so they were really concentrated in the uh, in the crossover sector. Some of those are starting to come back, and what we've seen over the last actually two weeks is more deposit inflow, kind of in scale, than we've seen line draws. So I think there's a lot of, of of just very defensive behavior early on as companies got their heads around one whether their banks were going to be there. And I think a lot of it was testing banks, and those are beginning to come back. Um, and then, uh, and then, just where was this thing going? And let's garner as much liquidity. So the market seems to have calmed down significantly. Um, people will draw and pay back, but we, we see it kind of regular way right now. And what we do expect is some of those deposits to be beginning to be used as companies go through periods of disruption. So we would expect a regular downdraft of, of the deposits that are sitting with us, and that's really why we did this cash burn analysis. That I, uh, that I that I talked about on Gerard's question, we can really see it client by client and track it yep. to make sure we, our analytics are right. I think the important thing, Don, too, is that we uh, did see uh, nice deposit growth away from just the companies who were drawing exactly. lines. Exactly. Uh, Ken, I think there's uh, yep. a good, a good uh, confidence that our LDR is going to continue to stay well behaved, particularly with all the liquidity that's in the system. Yep, excellent. And then, Bruce, uh, just a follow-up um, on the prior slide, you talk about um, assessing new opportunities arising from the current environment. I'm just wondering, is that, a, is, that, is that any change in what you had already been contemplating in terms of continuing to add to the franchise, and, and what, what types of things do you think might, you know, appear for you um, strategically in that regard? Yeah, so, you know, we, we had done uh, last year uh, when we rolled out Top 6 a fair amount of work on our just strategic thinking, uh, where are some 
opportunities where we have strengths that we have a right to win, that we can uh, leverage those strengths to find new revenue streams the way we did with education refinance or we did with our merchant partnerships. And so, uh, you know, growing citizens' access to digital bank, taking it to the next level was one. Uh, better serving small businesses, uh, SMEs was another. And then going, taking our merchant business in some new directions. I think all those things uh, still make a lot of sense, and we're continuing to, to keep up our investments there. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, how has the world changed, and are there additional offerings? Uh, certainly the world's becoming more digital as people have to stay home, and we see tremendous uh, upsurge in folks using uh, the online and mobile platform. And so what does that mean for the future? Uh, does it mean that, uh, you know, for example, uh, the wealth offering for uh, uh, mass affluent, that they might be more willing to deal with a virtual advisor? Is that business now going to take off? So we're just looking at a whole bunch of, uh, uh, you know, brainstorming sessions to think through the world's going to be different. How do we play? How do we make some additional investments uh, and retweak our, our overall way of bis- doing business and, and the strategy? All right, got it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. We'll go next to the line of John Pankari with Evercore ISI. Go ahead. Morning. Uh, morning. Uh, just, to, just to confirm, uh, so – when it comes to your loan loss reserve level now post the build that you put through this quarter, uh, so based on what you know now and your assumption for the direction of the uh, uh, of how this plays out, um, there's nothing you see that happened in April after you closed the books that will point to the need for an additional loan loss reserve build in second quarter for COVID? Well, I'll start off there. I mean, John, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, clearly, you know, Moody's scenarios have, have worsened. Uh, I think we have to digest what uh, we're hearing, um, uh, you know, and seeing um, in those updates. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we have, as one of our base scenarios, we have GDP falling 18% with a B-shaped um, recovery in 2H. Um, you know, the, the update from Moody's indicates, you know, GDP falling 30% with nevertheless still recovery later on. Um, you know, we have an internal... That, because just, just, you know, as it relates to, you know, John's specific question about closing your books, I mean, that scenario came out this week. And Correct. books were closed. So, exactly. uh, you know, I think we had the best information at the time we did our close, and I think we leaned on being at the conservative end uh, in the assumptions that we took. Uh, but uh, as we go through the months of April, it, it, it may be that people think this will be a bit deeper and it may last a little longer, and we'd have to come back and reassess that. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to put that in context of what you were assuming in terms of the shape of the recovery and what was dialed in. Um, okay. And then separately, in terms of on slide 16, your stressed um, analysis that you ran, uh, resulting in the 4.1. What was the stressed CET1 output from when you ran that? Yes, the stressed CET1 would be in the neighborhood in a severely adverse scenario. In you know, I, I guess I'd say this way in terms of what we submitted for 2020. In a severely adverse scenario, using our estimates of losses, which we we believe are quite prudent and um, and and predictive. We would be in the neighborhood of eight percent of set one. Okay, got it. All right, thanks. Better. And then one, it's probably a little better. Probably a little better. I mean, yeah. look at. I mean, that's probably maybe a a, a, a moment, a, a temporary low point. But you'd be in the something in the eight, oh, eight yeah. and a half range if you go quarter by quarter. We do the nine quarter um, outlook of somewhere ranging between eight and eight and a half. Got it. Okay. And did you disclose the amount of loan loss reserve against that $15 billion of um, higher risk sectors that you flagged? No, we did not. Okay. Got it. All right. Thank you. Yep. We have a, one last question. Q from the line of Saul Martinez with UBS. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my question. So, uh, I wanted to follow up on, um, I think it was Ken's question, just it's a bigger, just more bigger picture question. Obviously, 
Um, we're all kind of focused on what's directly in front of us right now. But during times like these, that's, you, you often will see more meaningful structural change, uh, more meaningful inflections in, in the competitive backdrop, um, consumer behavior. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any perspective on that. Have you had time to take a step back and, and kind of think about where the puck could be going and, and um, how the, the, you know, the situation um, will, will influence that? And in addition to that, how you think about your own strategy in that environment, for example, does it, you know, um, make citizens act, you know, the, uh, the importance of investing and being successful with the citizens access um, strategy that much more important as a client acquisition tool. So just more of a, of a broader question on the industry and how you think about um, how you sort of recalibrate or you might recalibrate your, your strategic initiatives. Um, so I'll ask Brendan to kick off on that one. Yeah, I, I mean, on the consumer side, the, um, the most obvious trend is an acceleration of one that was already happening, which is a drive to digitization. And so I look at all the things that we have in flight, uh, some of which we've got, uh, you know, a jump on our peers, like you pointed out, Citizens Access and a national banking digital franchise like Merchant Finance. Uh, you know, like the future of our uh, brick-and-mortar distribution network, how do we reposition it for consumers that have gotten used to coming in less frequently but still – being able to manage their money effectively and get advice. And Bruce pointed out, you know, virtual wealth advisors. We've got a lot of these things in motion. We've got a, a significant investment in our mobile and online banking platform that should start to go live in beta form in Q2. Uh, I view it as an acceleration of a lot of those things. So we're spending some time to figure out how do we get out on our front foot even more how do we capitalize on consumer trends that are changing very rapidly situationally? We think they could be very sustaining. Uh, and, and I think the, the level of confidence I have is high because we're in a position of strength to have all of these things already in motion with uh, teams making progress and taking share in the market. So uh, we're, we're trying to figure out which ones of those if it can choose to really put some significant acceler acceleration in. But that's how, how I sort of see it on the consumer side. Great. Thanks, Brenda. Um, just one quick follow-up on, on Cecil then. Um, you know, if, if we do see a, a, uh, a longer recovery and, and not a V-shaped recovery, um, and, and you did give some, some helpful um, reference points on, on your allowance by, by product type, and, and it seems this quarter the reserve build was really, you know, um, spread out across consumer and commercials. But what segments would you think are most vulnerable to reserve true ups and and because I do think your your loan book is a little different from a lot of other peers. You you do have a lot of loan types with weight longer weighted average remaining maturities, which, you know, for any given loss content will have a higher reserve. So I'm just curious like how sh we should think about sort of the evolution of those reserve rates if you were to have to build greater reserves. Yeah, so on twenty six of our materials, I mean we gave uh, some uh, a breakout of what the um, what drove the, mm -hmm. the 73 yeah. basis points that we put up. I mean, I think you know what drove Cecil in the first place being very very um, uh, you know uh, you know punitive uh, standard in terms of uh, versus incurred losses. As you mentioned, those those categories that have a lot of um, or have some uh, longer maturities associated with them. So uh, you look at in school as as a place that would be um, that would be a driver. Um, other other um, areas where there's higher loss content, but there's also higher returns, such as card and unsecured. Yeah. That's an area to keep an eye on. Um, and uh, so those are the two that jump out to me on page 26. Um, you know, and on the commercial front, you know, some of the some of the areas inside commercial maybe you know, show up with a little bit less less loss content, but um, but those are the top two that I, I see on page 26. Why is in school so much higher than refi? Um, or maybe it's an obvious answer. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you think about the, 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 that, what we mentioned a little earlier is that, that uh, and maybe Brennan can, can comment on this, that these, these are really high FICO, uh, you, know, yeah. you know, basically, you know, great credit risk, uh, great, great, um, you, know, um, you know, relationship opportunity, people that have been in the workforce for on average six years. I think yeah. the average comp is a six figure comp type uh, of, uh, of borrower. It's, it's pretty high quality yeah. versus being, yeah. you know, 
in school it's deferring well and you got usually have a parent guarantee on that but the thing that really kills yeah. you in the Cecil calculation is the maturity and these are you know, 10 12 yeah. 15 year uh, loans in many cases so so that's why that number's high we, we, we don't necessarily uh, think we'll have any immediacy to charge off on those portfolios but that's where Cecil doesn't uh, doesn't always give you the answer you would expect. And in fact, delinquency on those portfolios has hasn't sure. moved much at all yet. And so we're early innings on watching those portfolios, but we're we're liking what we're seeing so far. It's really duration. Remember, in school also has a four-year deferment period, where uh, mm. before they graduate, that extends the duration there too. So that's really what's driving the Cecil okay. the Cecil difference. Okay, okay. got to close it up. Right. Thank you. Uh, Sure. So uh, anyway, uh, thanks everyone for dialing in today. Uh, we certainly appreciate your interest and support. Uh, have a good day, and uh, please stay well. And ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude your conference call for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Speakers, please hold while I transfer you back in.